Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this session on how generative AI will revolutionize the economy. Uh, my name is Tom Lee Devlin. I'm The Economist's global business correspondent. Uh, and I'm delighted to be moderating uh, this fascinating panel uh, and thrilled to introduce our brilliant guest today. So we have Kayan Ruin, who is the founder and chair of the Happiness Foundation, uh, and also Heya AI, which is a nonprofit alliance that is looking to promote the responsible harnessing of AI. We have Aaron Bastani, who is co-founder of the independent media group Novara Media. And we have Johnny Penn, who is assistant professor of AI ethics and society at the University of Cambridge. Uh, now, as a journalist covering business and the economy, uh, I can comfortably say that there are few uh, developments in the past 12 months that have grabbed the world's attention more than the release of ChatGPT last November. I saw the, uh, the straw poll just a moment ago. I know many of you have, have experimented with ChatGPT already uh, and other similar generative AI tools as well, I'm sure. In fact, I imagine there's people in the audience who are building generative AI tools. I've had some fascinating conversations with a number of startups that are, that are experimenting with very novel ways of, of harnessing this technology. Uh, and it's a technology that's continuing to improve at an incredibly rapid rate. Every iteration of the underlying AI models uh, delivers higher quality output with, with lower error rates or hallucinations, as they call it in the jargon. And so perhaps it's unsurprising that this technology has sparked this immense debate as, as to how it will change the world and, and reshape our economy. And, and that's the debate we're going to be continuing for you today. Uh, so without further ado, the, the way I'd like to start is to just ask our panelists to cast their minds forward to 2030 and imagine how they think generative AI will have reshaped our economy by then. Uh, Aaron, I might start with you for this. Yeah, I, I think I would make a, a point at the beginning of the response, which would be that we have a habit of overstating change or overexpecting change in the short term and underestimating it in the long term. 2030 is somewhere in the middle, right? If you said 2025, I, w I would say, don't expect anything big. Uh, 2035 is probably medium term. I, I think by then, you're going to see a major, major shift. I mean, if I look at the industry that I'm in, media, culture, arts, take media. I think what it's going to mean is a massive fragmentation or a continued fragmentation of the media industry. Because right now, with these kinds of tools, you will be able to start a very effective outlet it could be activist-led, it could be you know, a front organization for a business, whatever. But as a media company, you could have five, six, seven, eight people and produce a tremendous amount of output. And I'll give you an example. This is already here. Uh, this isn't generative AI, but it's on a par with it, really, uh, which is now there are tools available to my colleagues at Navarra Media where you have proposed clips from, say, an hour, an hour and a half YouTube interview you know, you will be told this will perform better than this. This is where there's high levels of emotional tone or this is particularly informative. So I think what those tools mean generally is that we'll see, like I say, greater fragmentation and the cost of entry to media obviously falling for a very long time. I agree for 600 years since the printing press. But with the internet really for 20, 25 years, I think with generative AI that continues to plummet. I think with media, we've not seen the disruption end, which I think for newspaper owners is probably quite worrying. So media is, is, is one industry. I'd love to hear your reflections on, on other industries you think might experience significant upheaval as a result of this technology. Well, I suppose, you know, it, media is such a big word these days, particularly journalism. I would say, obviously, hybrid industries like marketing, advertising. I think, again, an ad agency or a creative design agency, you know, the cost of entry are going to plummet with this stuff. And so I think you can start a shop with five, six, seven people, like I say. That's a massive challenge to incumbents. If you're part of a, a legacy organization with hundreds of employees, th the grim truth for you is that there are people out there with less than 10 employees who are coming for your lunch. Um, so you, know, you need to get ready for that. So I, I, I think that's, that's the real scenario by 2030. I don't think that's revolutionary or um, anything new, like I said a moment ago. I think it's continuing trends we've really seen over the last 20 years. But that continuing fall in the cost of entry to media production uh, isn't going away, which I think will surprise people. Most people with disruption, they think, OK, this is a period of volatility, a period of disruption. will return to some kind of, you know, will plateau some norm. I don't think that's coming in media, maybe for my lifetime. You know, we saw it with Vice, this expectation that this is the new millennial outlet which will replace the older legacy organizations. 
hasn't happened. And I think we're going to continue to see that churn in the media space. Like I say, I think also implications in, in marketing and mm -hmm. advertising. Johnny, I'd like to call on you next. What's your vision of, of how generative AI is, is likely to transform the world by, say, 2030? Sure. I just have to say, I feel like I'm on the Hunger Games looking over at you guys, because it's, it's, <laughs> it's such a surreal uh, venue and experience and, and, and topic, in a way. Um, I have a different take on the future of AI than most, maybe. I'm a historian of AI. I'm very interested in how society will change uh, uh, because of uh, and around the, the tool set. The best metaphor I've thought to kind of describe what I see or intuitively kind of expect is uh, if, you, if any of you grew up playing sheet music uh, or playing music, you learned how to read sheet music. There were notes and there were rests. If you only had notes and you had no rests, it would be cacophony. And I feel like digital computing, the aesthetic around it in the last 70 years has been very maximalist. Industry, government, everybody's wanted to use computing you know, in every place we can imagine it. Mm. I think in my lifetime, I think it's already starting to happen that we will oversaturate. We'll start to realize that there are some things that it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense to computerize. It's too expensive. It's too resource intensive. You know, the tech companies, by my understanding, are struggling right now because they're not going to be able to meet their net neutrality, or net neutrality, their carbon zero uh, pledges with generative AI because it's too resource uh, uh, intensive. And so what I get excited about is looking for the rests. Uh, and what do I mean by rests? I mean deliberative restraint, purposeful not doing. Uh, and this could be, you know, the. Council of Newnham in this city saying we aren't going to allow facial recognition technology used by a government, aka us. That's fantastic. Or it could be young people, you know, choosing to wear this uh, lime green ring that's supposed to be an analog alternative to dating apps. We have a simple, you know, wedding ring to, to let other people know if we're taken. The, the green ring would be to acknowledge that you're single. And I just, I, I think that AI and the climate crisis are on orthogonal paths, and I think they're going to uh, run into each other. And I don't think generative AI, like, my concern in the sentence, just to bring this to a close, is the word revolution means a change to the existing social order. That's not probably the conversation to be had in this venue, even though it should be. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it's going to be uh, a bit of a, a rocky road to, to realize the full potential of what these, these tools can do. Could, could you say more about this, this point you raised there around uh, climate change and AI being on these kind of orthogonal paths? What did you mean by that? Well, it just, it just seems crazy to me the way we talk about using AI. It, it's so glib. It's, it's, you know, I'll put it this way. The history of, of the computer is often attributed to people like Alan Turing. Turing was important, but he was not where computers came from. Computers came from the British civil service needing to collect and, and sort and order you know, census data. Uh, you know, the, the British civil service was the first kind of computer. And administration is really, the history of administration is where you go to really understand you know, computing in, in the scale of centuries. AI, I think, is going to add to our burden. It's not going to take time. It's not going to save us time, because the time that it saves us will be reallocated to new obligations. And we can talk about that around labor if you want. The job numbers, I suspect, may look, you, you know, we were talking backstage or an email about the, the job apocalypse that never came. I suspect it's because you can kind of manipulate the numbers to make it look like jobs are steady. But the quality of those jobs are getting worse and worse and worse because you're having to you're, you're treated like a cog. You know, it, the uh, different jobs, including in academia, are becoming kind of gigified mm. uh, as they become digitized. Long story. I didn't sleep much last night, so you guys are getting spicy me today. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, I just think that um, you know further administration of otherwise you know analog social routines adds to the, resource, uh, the resources we need to operate society. And I just, think, I just think that developers are, by and large, kind of leaning towards over-engineering, because the money's flowing. But I don't think we need all that they are creating. 
I just want to push back a bit on the idea that AI will lower the quality of jobs over time. I can imagine a world where um, AI can actually eliminate you know, a lot of the relatively mundane parts of, of lots of jobs, uh, whether it's um, you know, auto-drafting emails or um, you know, doing a, a dry version of a, of a script for a show or, or a rough cut of, of an image. I mean, it, surely there are some professions actually where AI will be an incredible unlock and, and allow people to really focus on the more creative and you know, um, emotional and social parts of their work. I, I'll be quick because I don't want to dominate, but I, I think that depends on what class or caste you're in. Uh, so to give a historical parallel, you know, developers, uh, tech industry leaders have, have tended to talk about AI like the printing press. What they overlook is that the printing press was invented and it took 400 years for mass literacy. Uh, it, the printing press lowered the cost of pr printing a book and eventually the cost of paper came down but it was a social innovation, AKA you know, access to free education, that unlocked the full potential of, of that technology. I don't think we're gonna see the sort of emancipatory, liberatory moment uh, that people want, or not even want, pitch around AI until we have social innovations that are, that are as compelling, as historic, as memorable as the tools themselves. And the question I pose to my students is, which is the better invention, the weekend or the internet? Because we forget that we have to actually formalize rest. We have to actually formalize emancipatory you know, experiences and, and things like access to healthcare. And I worry that things, those things are gonna get eaten up in this kind of maelstrom of hype uh, around AI, even though there's amazing technological progress at the same time. That's great. I, I wanna come back to policy changes um, later in the discussion, but so Kayan, it would be great to hear your reflections on what the, the likely trajectory is in terms of the impact of this technology in the, in the decade ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. I actually agree a lot with what Johnny was saying uh, in terms of building the technology in a more mindful and, and purposeful fashion, which we haven't been super good at um, in, in, the, in the past decades. Um, and I also r am really optimistic in the long run, um, say 50 years or 100 years um, you know, forward, but less optimistic in the short term because I do think that governance of AI needs time uh, for people to come together, governments and corporates to come together to come up with the right approach to uh, regulating and, and governing, uh, governing AI. And, and also the public uh, engagement part is super important in that because with the absence of a structured approach towards governance of AI, I think it will trigger a lot of social unrest. Um, so people um, you know, are driven by panic and you know, uh, unemployment, and they just become uh, you know, anti-AI. So that will shape a lot of the trajectory of AI as well uh, in, the, in the coming decade. Um, so something I want to call out is I think um, for the coming decade, actually, a lot of the, where the technology is going is determined outside of technology itself um, because the capability will continue to improve. The capability is you know, more or less linear, um, but very often where this technology is going is impacted by what market wants. Um, so for example, towards the end of last year, we were seeing a bit of a market crash and you know, we are entering recession. And I do believe that ChatGPT's uh, premature launch was partially due to kind of reviving the market a bit, which uh, triggered um, a short-term bull market for 2023. Um, so we don't know how long this will last because the, the data is showing that we have, since the detachment from the gold standard in the 70s, we have been you know, doing this money printing um, to get through every single crisis, and that is not sustainable. Um, so there are uh, high chances that we are entering recession globally and, and potentially even a depression. So that will trigger a lot of cost savings. So I think in the next few years, um, how AI play a role in the wider macroeconomics is going to be super interesting. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is uh, in terms of the concentration of capabilities, um, because uh, Thomas Watson uh, famously uh, predicted that the world will be run by five computers, which is more or less the case now. Um, and I, I do think that eventually AI capabilities will be more concentrated than decentralized, which is 
It's difficult to say because centralized capability is easier to govern, but it's, it's, it also you know, kind of triggers this unequal wealth distribution and a lot of other problems, um, auto, you know, authoritarian governments and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's interesting to see how centralized this power will be and how this impact wealth uh, distrib mm -hmm. uh, distrib uh, distribution. Um, and lastly, um, I also think that given the, you know, the natural slow pace of regulation uh, and, and collaboration, uh, we will see AI-generated breakthroughs in science and technology in the next decade, uh, which will be fascinating, exciting. It will be amazing, especially in healthcare, uh, climate change, et cetera, energy. Um, but we will also see AI-generated catastrophes. Um, so these are going to be black swan events that are difficult to predict. Uh, and they will likely be surprises. So it's, it's like how this good and bad play out mm. in the coming yeah. decade is going to be super interesting. Um, there was a lot there, that, and, and a couple of points I wanted to, to circle back on. Um, you talked about you know, companies potentially um, shifting their focus towards cutting costs in the years ahead, given kind of the, the challenges around the economic environment. Obviously, we've had decades of low interest rates. Interest rates are rising. That's going to force companies and, and households to deleverage with, with all sorts of economic implications. Surely, AI is, is one tool for cost cutting and actually one way to try and turn around declining productivity. Um, so, I mean, I'd just be interested to hear your reflections on, uh, you know, this is very live at the moment in the, in the strikes over in the US and in Hollywood um, around the, the, the risk that, that uh, significant numbers of workers could end up finding themselves displaced as, as companies start to use these technologies to try and lower their costs. Do you think those fears are, are grounded in reality? Do you think that's right or, or not? I think so. I think... Um Right now, we, we do lack a bit of a global leadership, uh, effective leadership in kind of getting through the hard times ahead because the economic problem is a bit of a time bomb. Um, so it's difficult to predict when it's going to happen, and I do kind of see a collapse coming of the current economic system. <laughs> and hopefully, in the long run, we will be seeding a new paradigm, uh, which is more on the solution side. Um, but the next few years is going to be difficult. Uh, but there are a few factors in the un unemployment Thing. So one is um, how, how fast uh, governments are rescaling uh, risk people. So in terms of education, training, uh, skills, uh, transition, um, repurposing your life, and all uh, resilience training and all of these things um, is, is kind of unprecedented. So obviously we have gone through the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution. You know, humanity has been through this kind of massive transitions before. So that's why I'm, sh I sh I'm sure that in the long run everything is going to be fine. But we are the transitional generations, so there is a bit of, uh, you know, there is a bit of uncertainty in how how we tackle this. Um, and the other thing is, um, in terms of large companies, you know, that have been employing a lot of people, like banking industry, uh, consulting industry, and you know, marketing, and you know, all the other large companies, um, if they are gonna actually lay off a lot of people and use AI, they will be dependent on a few big players for their productivity. Um, so that is an uh, inherent risk that can never, that might be difficult to get over. Because mm -hmm. imagine now already there are, you know, 200 banks is depending on, say, Microsoft, Google infrastructure, right? So, and that is just infrastructure. But if it's becoming productivity and labor, uh, so that kind of dependency mm -hmm. might be too much. So yeah. these kind of companies become a societal inf uh, critical infrastructure, and that's something that we have never really tackled before. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's one other point that I wanted to pick up there, and um, uh, both uh, yourself and, and other panelists, please jump in on this. You, you uh, raised this idea that you know, in the long run, things will be fine, even if in the short run, there might be disruption. And when it comes to AI, there are certainly people, including Yuval Noah Harari, who we had at the conference yesterday, who argue that this time is fundamentally different, because we now have a technology that uh, is able to replicate such a broad sweep of, of human capabilities, moving not just from kind of physical uh, and routine tasks to cognitive tasks as well. Is it possible that this time is different, and actually in the long run, things won't be all right? I uh, I, I just say briefly, I'm, I'm amazed at the platitudes of, of the kind of thinker, the thinkers in this space sometimes, because like Mustafa Suleiman has done great work 
uh, on AI ethics. I very much appreciated him pushing that in a corporate context. Not easy to do. This is the founder of DeepMind, speaker at this event, uh, has a new book in which he talks about this is the, mo the moment that we move from atoms to bits. We move from the industrial economy to the information economy, which is like what people said in the late 90s and 2000s mm. and then withdrew. The, the founder of Wired magazine, the, the guy who started uh, MIT Media, or the, the MIT, uh, anyways, I don't remember the, the, the body at MIT. The point is, like, <laughs> the irony of talking about the, the, the slide into bits is like the atoms don't go away. This world is getting harder and harder to live on, unfortunately, like the floodings this year being yet another reminder of that. And, you know, with Harari, with, uh, Harari I, I, I don't know, I just, I think we have an expertise problem. I think we're looking to the wrong people for guidance on how society works. Uh, I appreciate the kind of idea that you could summarize all of human history and then also have a take on AI, shots fired, but uh, I don't <laughs> think, I don't think that, that they're necessarily accountable for the sort of stories that they tell. And I think in this instance, we ought to be accountable because a lot of people are going to lose out. A lot of people are already losing out short of AI. Um, yeah, I feel like Aaron will have some things to say. No, no, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've said many things I would say myself. I think Stuart Brand has a really interesting innovation around this stuff in the long now. He talks about pace layers. And the deepest pace layer, of course, is, is nature. Um, which we are a part of. We might not like that sometimes. That's what that line sounds like. I don't want to be a part of nature. It's sort of, you know, a post-material theology, but we are. Um, and on those pace layers, you have, you know, nature, you have culture, you have infrastructure, and on the top, you have mental conceptions and fashions. And I think the idea that you can just discard the deepest pace layers, which is the sort of the deepest trajectory through which history flows, I think is quite um, egotistical, frankly. Secondly, I would say we've had massive disruptions in, in, in history, which we just take for granted. Obviously, 12,000 years ago, the Neolithic Revolution. More recently, the Agricultural Revolution. And this is hugely important, I think, for an AI context. Until three, 400 years ago, 50% plus of the labor market in Europe works in agriculture. Today, it's in this country less than 2%, in the US, less than 1%. So, and obviously, that had an array of after effects, but life did go on. And so you can see a world where, OK, 60, 70 percent of the tasks, not necessarily the jobs that we have today, they're automated. Society does continue. I mean, that may lead to a quote unquote collapse of various things, and I agree with your comment about that. But I, I still think we'll be here, and I still think, you know, people will think it's normal. Finally, the thing about lots of um, consultants and accountants and people in white collar jobs being laid off because of AI, I find this so interesting because the point you were making is, cost cutting, there'll be savings, people will be laid off, we'll get to some kind of equilibrium. What's new with all this, for the first time really in a century, is that the, the layoffs are going to be for white collar industries. And you're going to see a massive overexpansion of surplus elites, everybody loves saying that word at the moment, but it's true, of, of basically laid off McKinsey grads. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's a really interesting political variable. I think those people will become quite politicized, potentially. So right now, we view populists as either Farage and Le Pen. But in 15 years' time, you may have a, a, a political populist who has a particular read on AI, and that's because they were laid off in the early 2020s, having jumped through all the hoops, having got the graduate debt, and they still couldn't get the kind of lifestyle they wanted. I think that's the future for young people right now entering the labor market, and AI may really scotch their hopes. You know, I graduated in 2008. You know, poor me. Uh, and we've seen in this country sort of 15 lost years with regards to any productivity gains. A very different problem for that cohort, but I think in a way it will have its own political overhead. And I think that's just something to think about. It's easy to talk about layoffs in the abstract because in our sort of, for our, in, our, in our mental sort of landscape, we think that means 70s, 80s, manufacturing layoffs, blue collar workers. This is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the kinds of people who historically have viewed themselves as having political, cultural, social power, dare I say, people in touching distance of the elite. And if those guys are at the forefront of layoffs and, 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 and technological unemployment, I think that's inflected very differently to what we saw in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 30s. Um, and, and one potential counter-argument, I suppose, is um, technologies often create new classes of jobs that didn't exist before. Um, so a social media manager, you know, today is a, is a profession that 20 years ago 
I'm quite sure didn't exist. Um, some professions like elevator operators or human alarm clocks disappear, other ones are created. So uh, I might turn this one to you, Kay, and do, what kind of professions do you think might be created as a result of generative AI? We already have prompt engineering, right? So I think that's a big one. Um, and I do see uh, definitely more demand on, on security and risk um, professions. Um, but I think a little bit linked with what uh, Aaron is saying, um, I do see you know, kind of, um, some kind of you know, massive layoff coming on the horizon. But one of the, um, one of the mitigation of that is that I think we should teach people entrepreneurship. And I think those people who got laid off will still use AI tools to start new businesses and to be creative in creating those new jobs. So I think we will see a wave of like, creativity and innovation coming from that transition. And there will be new jobs um, being created through that process. But right now, it's difficult to predict um, you know, how people will <laughs> compete with the increasing AI capability. But, uh, and also, I think, to Johnny's point, um, I do think that we should be conscious of what jobs are being replaced. Um, because if this activities and jobs are creating fulfillment and are bringing joy to people, like a lot of the, the creative tasks, then maybe they should be uh, slower to be replaced. We, we probably need to introduce some kind of uh, you know, checks and balances uh, to put human joy and fulfillment in the center of how we choose yeah. which jobs to be replaced versus the other. Um, but just to close out on this comment, uh, just back on you know, the earlier uh, question, um, I do believe that we should evaluate AI under the context of evolution, so human evolution and evolutionary history. Um, and I think AGI is going to be a new phase of human evolution. Um, so that will be different from every single other major innovation, inno innovation that have happened in history, like printing press, um, et cetera, nuclear. Um, and also, I think we are definitely in a transitional phase of a massive revolution that is an in intelligence revolution um, after the industrial revolution. And I do believe the next one is going to be a conscious revolution. Um, so the future is bright, but the short term is very uncertain. Hmm. Well, I think maybe before we reach artificial general intelligence, one challenge we're going to have to grapple with as a society is an aging population and, and a workforce that will start to decline. Um, and I suppose another argument one could make around the impact of this technology is that um, it, it, it will start to become adopted and seep through the economy just as businesses are actually struggling to find the workers that they need. So, you know, it's possible if we don't progress AI at sufficient pace, we may end up in a situation where the problem is not a lack of jobs, it's a, it's a lack of workers to do them. And that leads to inflationary pressure and all sorts yeah. of other challenges. Yeah. So I'd be interested to hear thoughts from the panel around how demographics interacts with, with this seismic technological change. Or you want to go, if you... Yeah, I mean, I'm writing my ne next book about this, so I have very <laughs> strong feelings about demographic change. You know, I think building on what you said a few moments ago as well about the challenges moving forward, I view the next 25, 35 years really as being inflected by, yes, climate systems breakdown, yes, rising inequality, which automation is probably going to ramp up both within and between nations, and that will have massive political overheads. But demographic aging, I think, in the medium term is this huge, huge, huge challenge because at the very time, of course, you have a growing subsection of the population with really high care needs because they're reaching 85, 90, 95, 100, you have a comparatively shrinking workforce. Uh, well, I think we're probably all aware of that because, of course, declining birth rates and longer life expectancy, that's a, it's an important trend. It's a trend that results from success, but it's an important trend. And so already in the US, you're seeing that the, I think three, the three jobs which are growing the most quickly in the US are related to care work adult and social care, healthcare. So we're already moving there. And my worry is, bringing in sort of class politics analysis here is, if let's say we do automate many tasks, we have far fewer professions, et cetera, et cetera, in 30 to 40 years time, what does that mean? People are laid off, they go to the areas where jobs are being created, care, basic supply and demand, what does that mean? Wage compression, because you have more people wanting, you know, yes, there'll be more of those jobs, but I don't think it'd be sort of proportional to um, the number of people seeking new ones. So I think there is, in a way, actually, if anybody here is a trade unionist or a labor organizer, the, one of the real pinch points of the economy in 20, 30 years is going to be elderly care. And that, that will be the case because those will be some of the last jobs to be automated. And the need is going to be on the rise. I'd say one final mega trend alongside the demographic aging, and this is sort of further out, is religious fundamentalism. 
And I think people are sleeping on this. You know, I think in the 2300s, they may look back on secular liberalism as a, what was that all about? Um, there's a great book on this, uh, The Religious Shall Inherit the Earth, um, which looks at really birth rates amongst uh, Hasidim in Israel, um, religious fundamentalist Muslims, Mormons, or various other sects in the United States. Their birth rates are often six, seven, eight kids per person. For secular liberals, actually, the more secular and liberal you are, the fewer children you have. You see this in the UK with Boris Johnson having eight children. I'm just joking. You know, mm -hmm. I've only got one on the way in a month. So that's a bit of a joke. He's a bit of a liberal anyway. But you can see the point. And so we have this, in I mean, it's fascinating from a social sort of uh, observation point of view, which is this confluence of climate systems breakdown, an intelligence revolution, demographic aging, and potentially people moving to or back towards ideas which are quite pessimistic and critical about the capacity of technology to actually solve the other problems. Uh, and I'll finish with this. You know, I love literature as a sort of a place to think about these ideas. And one of the best books for that is Dune. And it talks about the Butlerian Jihad, which is this you know, historic event which precedes the events in the book where people decided to effectively destroy thinking machines. And what they did instead is engage in a social innovation you talked about this earlier on, which is they start to create human computers, which is you know, the, the Mentat. They use um, consciousness-enhancing drugs to turn this person into a computer rather than rely on a thinking machine. Now, again, that sounds, sounds all rather odd, but that's the, the critical point, which is that the social innovations are what matter alongside the technological ones. And the big social innovation trends are aging, religious fundamentalism, which, like I say, run counter to to some of the technology, so very interesting. And I should just finally add the caveat, of course, this breaks down differently by civilization and country. East Asia is on a very different trajectory mm -hmm. to North America. Well, um, we've heard some pretty terrifying <laughs> prognostications about the future of humanity, I think it's fair to say. Um, and we have a, a little bit less than 10 minutes left. So what I'd like to hear um, from the panelists on for the last few minutes is what should we do about all this? And when I say we, I mean governments, I mean businesses, I mean other societal institutions. What are the guardrails or, or changes or structures that need to be put in place to shape the trajectory of this technology such that it has a positive outcome on society in, in the decade ahead? Kay, and I might start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think pragmatically we are, we are working with governments and you know, coming up with um, a cost-benefit assessment for AI. I think that needs to be a very granular one, uh, because when we talk about AI, it often means so many different things. Um, and the first step is to categorize AI into different, uh, different types. Um, and some are you know, much more risky than the other. Um, you know, for example, AI companion, you know, should it be banned altogether? You know, that's a, uh, it's not a straightforward question, and it's one of the you know, fastest growing and easy, you know, one of the most easily funded um, you know, uh, growth area in AI. Um, so that cost-benefit uh, cost assessment needs to be um, built through collaboration with a lot of experts from very different uh, backgrounds. And that's, I think, to Johnny's point, kind, kind of concentration of expertise, um, because this is not something that can be solved by technologists or philosophers or ethics only. It has to be solved by many, many kind of experts coming together from you know, child development, uh, human development, to economists and uh, faith leaders and all those kind of people. Um, and I think that process needs to be as democratic as possible, which is something that is not being done that much at all right now, because it's so much of a small group of people deciding where this is going in Silicon Valley, um, or it's very much an elite-driven um, um, thing. So how to engage with the public to make sure that they are feeling empowered, they know, how, uh, you know if they have a say in this process, they are shaping where the technology is going is very important. And the third one is how we are basically kind of transitioning from the old model to the new model. And I do see a new economic paradigm shaping up in the next few, next few years, um, hopefully through this kind of collapse of systems. Um, and I hope that economic paradigm is more circular. You know, there's a lot of circular economy stuff coming up, which is really good. But also, I think that we should focus more on, you know, what is human flourishing and how can we put human flourishing in the center of the new economic model. Um, and human flourishing means, you know, things like meaning, purpose, uh, quality connection, community, mental well-being, and those things are intangible things, and it's difficult to, um, to measure, and it's, uh, it's, it's not the same as you know, material growth that is easier to track, and I think 
um, you know, hopefully we're moving more from a, a kind of outward material production kind of economy to more inward, intangible uh, growth model that's completely different. Um, so I think that transition is going to be very positive, but it's difficult to make that happen because today, you know, the funding is going to, you know, the company that is, you know, going to the next one billion users the fastest possible, and that is not, you know, always, that is often not the right product to build, right? Mm -hmm. There is no, uh, not enough check and balances, bef um, you know, before any product goes to, goes to market. And I think, um, you know, social media was one of the examples um, that we did not have such a, a cost-benefit assessment yeah. um, before it was launched. And it's clearly damaged um, mm -hmm. a mental well-being of a generation. And, and plastics is another example that, um, you know, if we had, you know, it was, uh, amazing when it was invented, right? Everybody thought it was amazing, but a few generations down the road, it becomes uh, such a disaster. Um, so I think it's, it's a difficult one because mm. it's not black and white and it's not linear. And that's yeah. why this kind of problems need more, uh, more investment and more collaboration and more uh, call to action. Aaron, yeah. Johnny, I'll, I'm going to give you two minutes I'll each, be, I'll be one minute. I'll give Johnny three minutes because I'll be on about <laughs> demographics. I would say that people may be familiar with the work of Neil Postman. He wrote a great book called um, Amusing Ourselves to Death. I would recommend a book called Technopoly. And he says there's a trifold sort of a tri tripartite historical formation really with human beings, tool using societies, technocracies, technopolies. He says we're in a technopoly. It is not us using the technology, but the technology which uses us. And so we need a more thoughtful relationship to technology. And I think that needs to percolate into politics and of course into resource allocation. And I, I saw this interview with Tony Blair in the FT today, and he said, you know, it's, the future is about mastering the technologies of the future. Just nonsense cliches. This is a man, by the way, who left office in 2007, and 2008 rather, he sent a text message to, 2007, to Alistair Campbell, uh, this is Anna, Alistair Campbell saying this, saying, wow, you can write words on a phone. Okay, everybody normal had a phone from what, 2000, 2001. So these cliches from the political class, I think are very dangerous there's not just me attacking a politician here. That, that sentence captures an entire mindset for regulators, policymakers, politicians, advisors, economic leaders. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. And I think personally, it's going to lead to long term political social decline for the countries that don't change course. Johnny. Uh, really fascinating to hear from, from all of you about this stuff. And I, I have to say, you know, I think I, I want to use criticism as a way to break through the platitudes because we've all probably heard the same version of this panel you know so many times that you know it, it's worth shaking it up and, and speaking from the heart uh, in my opinion and I, I, I appreciate hearing from both my colleagues here I I look at the history of AI not necessarily as a history of successes like you can kind of understand the origin story of AI as a series of failures Symbolic AI didn't work, so they moved to expert systems. That was a move from like general intelligence to localized intelligence, which at the time was very controversial because they said that's not a, it's not you know intelligence at all. You're just doing kind of siloed attempts at individual kind of professional duties. After that kind of fell away, we had machine learning, and now we have generative AI on the back of, of machine learning. Uh, but those, again, are kind of like, you know, the charges are around kind of institutional plagiarism now that generative AI is working in part because it's churning up existing, existing intellectual property and then representing, kind of, uh, you know, spitting it out as something new and, and, and maybe able to be copyrighted. If we think about it as a history of failures as opposed to a history of successes, it, it helps to sober a little bit the conversation. I love AI, don't get me wrong. I think it's really fascinating and I think there's a lot we can do with it. I just don't like it when it's treated as this kind of silver bullet for other social you know, uh, issues and, and problems. And I would say to answer your question then about what should corporations do, what should businesses or uh, governments do, my recommendation would be to write a decomputerization statement. I was surprised to learn that the word decomputerization is not in the dictionary. So if you put it into Gmail or Google Docs or Microsoft Word or something, it's got the little red squiggly line underneath it. Uh, decomputerization means to remove computerization from a particular social you know, or, or mechanical serv service or, yeah. 
And I think this is going to be a bigger part of our future than we imagine, partly because of this saturation issue. And in the same way that people have turned away from dairy, have, have become vegetarian, and lifestyles have changed in accordance with our changing world, I think decomputerization and a steer away from AI is, is inevitable. And companies should start owning what makes them them separate from the technology. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for, for bringing this topic to life and, and raising some really thorny, difficult questions for us. So please give them a round of applause.